welcome everybody. Uh, today's session, we'll be talking about uh, basic tuning for mobile applications. Um, we have another session that we talk about marine applications. That's a, a different session. We'll be doing that later on today. So for everyone that joined, it doesn't know who I am. My name is Steve Teresi, and I'm the Director of Training and Technical Services here at JL Audio. I'm located in Southern Florida, just a couple of miles north of the uh, main headquarters for JL Audio. Today with me, I have Mr. Kevin Ferry in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Say hello, Kevin. Good morning, everybody. And out in Southern California, I have Rob Haynes, our presenter for today. Say hello, Rob. Hello. There you go. You got it right this time. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, so, you know, we're actually uh, streaming live in two locations here on WebEx. If you look on the right-hand side, you'll see the chat function over there. If you don't see it along the bottom edge of the screen, there's some bubbles there. There's one that looks like a chat bubble. If you open that up, Kevin and I will be keeping an eye on the chat there. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live, you can go ahead and put questions and comments into the feed there. And Kevin and I, again, will be keeping an eye out on that as well. Just note that the Facebook feed is a slight lag between what we said and when you hear it. So uh, sometimes it, you know, be a little bit before we get to some of the information you might be looking for. Speaking of that information, all these trainings that the guys and I have put together have really been structured specifically for these web-based trainings. And the idea behind them is very short, very focused content that lasts between 30 and 45 minutes. And we usually hit those, <laughs> um, but again, we value your time and appreciate that you're carving out a little bit of it to spend it with us. Um, and I think I got everything this time, guys, did I? I think you're good. I think we're good. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Rob. Oh, by the way, if you need to get Rob's attention, Rob, you are presenting, right? Yes, I am. Okay, if you need Rob's attention, he can't see the comments, so we can talk bad about him behind his back. Uh, but Kevin and I can flag him down when we can to kind of share some of the uh, comments that come in both on Facebook as well as on the WebEx chat. So um, don't send any private messages to Rob because he won't see him until after he's done. Sound good? Rob, take it away. All right. Let me just uh, share my screen. Thank you, Steve. Remove that. All right. So, good morning, everybody. Exciting session for me. Um, what? If you said good morning, there was silence. So I said good morning because the whole class <laughs> say that good morning, Mr. Uh, Haynes. Uh, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah, this is this is like school. Yes. <laughs> um, this is actually an exciting session for me today. Um, for those that have joined us for the previous, uh, we'll all start to put it together now. Um, in our previous sessions for this DSP amplifiers course, we've discussed the hardware for VXI and MVI. We discussed some of the basics of how to acquire and uh, some basic functions of our Tune soft software platform. We've talked about audio terminologies and basics. We've uh, discussed um, phase and time. We've discussed the three pillars. Uh, if you remember in the previous session about how to acquire a perfect center image, we discussed there's three pillars that we need to focus on. We need to focus on levels. We need to focus on frequency response and time. And then in our last session, Kevin did a good job of walking us through our tune software. So how to actually start using it. What happens when you click here? What happens when you click there? So we've taken all of this content and laid a foundation to where we can now get into the tuning process, which is what I'm sure everyone's been waiting for. Um, so the class today is called the basic tune. And um, this is a really a cool training for me because I've always felt when uh, we mentioned DSP, it's almost as if it has to be a competition level system. It's gotta be a competition level tune. All of the instruments have to be perfectly placed across the dashboard, but I don't necessarily think that's the case. Uh, I don't think a lot of listeners are going to pick up on that stuff. I think most listeners want something in their car that's loud, fun, dynamic, and reliable. And that's really what this basic tune is all about. So we're going to review the, uh, the process and then go a step-by-step -step, um, run through of the actual tune. We'll have a bunch of images to show the, the uh, process step by step, and then we'll wrap it up with a video at the end showing how quick you can make a car sound great, especially with our tune software platform. So, as I was saying, the basic tune for me is the it, great process for just about any listener. 
um, without a doubt, it's going to sound better than any non DSP system out there because we're going to be able to go in and remove a lot of annoying peaks of excess energy in the vehicle. So we're going to have a more tonal, flat, smooth response. Um, and I think that's kind of interesting, you know, you could have the same product in multiple cars, but have a completely different listening experience because of how the cabin reacts to everything. So the whole idea of tuning is to really remove those big bumps of extra energy. So we have that nice uh, flat response. We looked at some curves uh, in previous sessions that Steve showed us. And again, we'll look at some curves today and, and talk about how to make adjustments to make our acoustical measurements from our RTA or FFT further mimic what that curve is going to look like. Um, if this is, if you're a type of listener to where you need more, you want that perfect sound stage where you know where exactly every single instrument is on the dash. If you really want to get into the phase domain and talk about impulse measurements, don't worry. That'll be coming up uh, in sec session 301 where Steve will get into what we call the advanced tune, where we get more into the phase domain outside of just taking measurements that we're going to do with the basic tune. So with that said, let's start putting all of this. Well, let, me just, let me just add something real quick that pretty much everything in the basic tune, it's sort of a, a smaller version of what a more advanced tune would be. We're still addressing all the main things that the three pillars approach is going to break down to. We're going to look at mag uh, frequency response. We're going to look at level and, and we are going to do some some things with time, we're just not going to eh, spend as much time with time uh, on the basic level because that can get kind of deep and a little bit more involved. The analysis is deeper. So when we refer to the basic tune, we're not discounting any of the things that happen at those higher level tuning sessions. It's just we realize that they could take a lot longer and they can they can really drag on a little bit if you're, if you're not careful. So we came up with the idea of a, a more basic tune as a way of getting really great results within the construct of what we talked about with those three pillars, you know, the, the things that we're looking for for staging and imaging. But we have to give some concessions here and there in, in order to save some of that time. A lot of what Rob's going to share with us can be done within, you know, 10 to 20 or 30 minutes worth of tuning effort and get spectacular results. And as Rob said, much better than you'd get if, it, if you didn't have the powerful DSPs that, you know, we typically work with or that you find in a VXI or an MBI amplifier. So you're taking advantage of it and getting a ton of performance out of it. But, you know, back in my day when we talked about racing, you know, like cars and enhancing performance, you get a certain amount of performance and it, it costs a certain amount of money or it takes a certain amount of time to get that little bit of extra on the top end of that, the amount of time or the amount of money in racing, <laughs> it, it's going to take a lot more. So that incremental improvement at the end is what we're talking about when we get into the advanced stuff, as you'll see in our uh, uh, session 301 that's uh, tomorrow morning. Um, but what Rob's going to focus on now is still using the same tool set, but in a more streamlined way. That's why we call it more basic. Sorry, Rob, I didn't mean to take your time there. No, no, that, that, that was perfect. So, I mean, I, I, I want to make it very clear. This is a phenomenal tune. Just because we call it basic doesn't mean it's not going to sound great. It's like what Steve was saying. This is all about making the car sound really good in a, in a reasonable amount of time. Because when you get into these advanced tunes, if you don't, especially if you're new to this, it could be hours or days. And sometimes the more you try to fix, the worse you make the car sound actually. So this is a great way to-, to, to, I mean, to make I've done that a million time. times. <laughs> I'll always remember when we were first developing this tune, uh, Steve went in and started playing around in Manville's car and he saw Manville's uh, RTA results. And Steve, I, I remember I was there, Steve said, I could do better than that. And while his curve boss. looked nicer, <laughs> The acoustical response were not as nice. So sometimes you don't want to fix all of these little extra details, because especially in a car where there's reflective services, road noise, we're probably not going to hear a lot of that minute stuff we're trying to fix uh, when the vehicle's in motion. So with all of that said, <laughs> further on that, hold on one sec, sorry. <laughs> my goodness, man. Rob, Rob <laughs> said something that I know he's going to hit later, but with the, the story about Manville's car, absolutely true, every word of it. I thought I could outdo them. And although like my curve might have been better, it just didn't sound as good. And you know how we know? Because we actually listened to it. And that is the most important part of tuning is not matching curves or looking at phase traces or doing any measurements or any of that stuff is you got to make sure it sounds good when you're done. And the only way to do that is by listening to it. So yes, the curve is a good starting point, but once you get in, you make your changes and you go from there. And now I'm going to be quiet for at least a minute. 
Well, I, I figure by switching slides to the steps, that would allow me to transition into it. So, <laughs> all right. So the steps to the basic tune. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is configure our uh, amplifiers or our tweak DSP using tune software. Again, um, this is where you really should take advantage of that setup tool. Um, as we showed in session 106, with uh, when Kevin walked us through it, and that setup tool really simplifies the process and is one of the keys to the basic tune because a couple of clicks and you're tuning the car instead of having to write out all of your inputs, all of your outputs, do your signal path routing, crossovers. It's all done for us with the setup tool. This is also where we can put the, the measurements from the listening location, probably the driver's seat, since that's that's usually the sweet spot in the car. So when we're doing distance measurements, I'm going to say you want to measure from the tip of your nose in the location where the listener is going to be uh, sitting. So if it's your car, not a problem. If you're an installer working on someone else's car, make sure the seat is in the location the listener will be seated in. Otherwise, it's going to mess up your measurements. And with a buddy, you're going to measure from the tip of your nose to every speaker in the vehicle, tweeters, mid-range, if you're running active up front, your rear speakers, your subwoofers. If you're running passive speakers, that's not a problem. We can still tune a car with DSP if we're not active. Just make sure when you're doing the distance measurements, you measure to your mid-range drivers only, because that's really where the meat and potatoes of the audio spectrum is going to be coming from. Write those distances down on a piece of paper, and then you can input those into the setup tool uh, during the initial process for um, setting up your uh, VXI or tweak project file. Those can also be input later on on the tune tab within tune software if it's not done during the uh, initial setup tool process. But that'll handle pillar three for us. That's that time pillar that helps make sure we have an anchored center image. After that, to set our uh, initial levels we're going to take acoustical measurements we're going to then start making adjustments based off of what the measurements going to tell us and again we'll break down each of these in just a moment here but i always start with level trim level trim is a great way in an active system to balance your speakers tweeters are extremely efficient so they're going to be significantly louder than your mid-range and mid-bass drivers probably so we can probably use level trim to get those at the same amplitude level as other speakers. Then we're going to look at the high pass and low pass filters. Are those causing any weird acoustical responses? Then we can get into the EQ corrections and both of their pillar two, which is their frequency response. Then we're going to review levels and listen to it. So starting off with configuring tune, as I already said, please use the setup tool. It's quick. It guarantees a properly set up, uh, set up system every single time, and it's efficient. You can just boom, 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 start tuning the car. You can do it ahead of time before you're even in the vehicle, which is nice. I know when uh, my first system, both my systems where I've had my old car with Tweak, my new car with VXIs, I had everything laid out and configured before I got to the vehicle. When I got to the vehicle, after the installations were done, all I had to do was plug my computer in, flash the amps, if you will, and I was up and running to start making my level and EQ adjustments. So uh, the setup tool is definitely a, a big uh, help there. And again, that's where we're gonna put our initial distances for signal delay to make sure all the speakers arrive to the listening location at the same time, help prevent any uh, what's called comb filtering, which is when you have same frequencies arriving at different points in time, it yields to cancellation in your frequency response, which could affect your center image. So that's why we uh, we put that there. And there's a lot of people that will say, oh, distances isn't the right way. Distance measurement, I'd say 90, will get you 98, 99% of the way there. Um, when we, we did tests comparing distance to actual impulse measurements. And like the differences at most were maybe, uh, you know, not even a millisecond. Uh, I'm gonna go a step further than you, Rob. I'm gonna say it's perfect. Unless you're actually analyzing phase traces, there's nothing wrong with using a tape measure, nothing. Now, you could argue with a coaxial or something like that, it's gonna be a little weird because, you know, what's the true point source, but like Rob's saying, it, you're within spitting distance of being dead on anyway. So I would, I would have no disclaimer at this point, other than if you wanted to actually analyze phase traces, then you'd need to get a little bit more potentially accurate. But you know, the, the, the testing that we've done in almost all cases, the tape measure is just as good as anything else you're likely to do. 
unless you're looking at the traces. Perfect. So after we get all that done, then we're going to go to setting our levels. Um, level setting is very important when you're working with DSP-based products. Uh, if we don't have proper levels, um, we could have not enough output. We could be overdriving things and have clipping, especially on the digital side. Digital clipping, not a fun sound <laughs> to hear. Um, this is also really important if you have a standalone DSP like a tweak. You know, a tweak has its own input sensitivity. And if your input and output levels aren't set up properly there, they're going to get more and more messed up downstream when we start getting into the amplifiers. So we have a very simple process with Tune software to set input levels on both VXI and Tweak products. And if you go into Tune software on that setup tab at the top, you will see uh, an inputs label at the top of the inputs panel with two little arrows next to that. When you click those arrows, that opens up a drawer. On VXI based products, you're going to have drop down menus with uh, minimum to 11. Uh, Tweak will give you the same drop down menus with minimum to 11 for your level, but instead of colored dots, you have a VU meter. And the whole idea when setting levels with VXI and Tweak is you're going to play a frequency appropriate sine wave for that channel. So if it's a mid range driver, you know, 1K, if it's a mid bass driver, 300 hertz. 50 hertz for a sub. I usually say tweeters, you probably don't need to worry too much about levels because they're so efficient. You, you're going to have more than enough power. You only need a couple watts of power to really properly drive a tweeter. So just make sure we're not overdriving the inputs. But we're going to essentially pick uh, the highest number value in that drop down menu that yields solid yellow dots. If we have green, that means signal's good but we need a little more sensitivity for the amplifier to safely hit its max output. If we have red, it means we're overdriving the inputs. If it's yellow flickering red, that means we are overdriving a little bit still. So we wanna go down a level. And I actually have a quick video that shows you how quick and easy this process is. So this is me doing um, level setting in my car. This is a high using advantage of VXI's high level inputs. And actually the, uh, channels from my Acura amplifier that are being fed straight into VXI, which will explain why the levels are a little different on some of the channels. So going through, you'll see when I click the two arrows here that opens up the drawer and right at the top, you'll notice on level seven, my inputs are already overdriven. They're flashing red. So I'm going to select a number, wait a couple seconds, still clipping, but three, we'll wait a sec, bam. So three was the magic level for that channel pair. So now I'll go to my, uh, my mid-range drivers, change, uh, put on an appropriate sine wave. Okay, yellow's good. Can I get a little more by going to three? Nope, three's overdriven. So two's the magic number, that pair of channels. And that's how quick, easy, and consistent setting levels with VXI and Tweak is. So no more guessing, no more oscilloscopes. Um, just use the, the color-coded signal indicators with sine waves and tune software and your levels are properly set right off the bat. If you are using a tweak, make sure you also, with those sine waves, get your outputs configured properly as well. VXI, we can do that during the tuning process, but on tweak, you have to make sure you're also at your max non-clipped output before you start setting levels on the amplifier, or you may need to address that a little bit later on. So once we get our levels set, we can start taking um, acoustical measurements. So we're gonna play pink noise through different um, quadrants of the car, if you will. And we're gonna use an RTA or FFT, a microphone in the driver's seat or wherever the, the tune is being configured for. And we're really gonna look for one of four curves that we wanna make adjustments to. And out of these four curves, really, we wanna use the curve that closest mimics what your acoustical response is giving you. So. Again, we want to kind of work with what the car is providing and just take out spikes of energy. So pick the curve that's going to best suit the vehicle based off of what the raw um, untuned response is going to be. And you're going to aim for one of these four curves. You may notice there's some similarities to them. There's always going to be a bit of boost on the low frequency side of things. Our ears are weighted for bass. If we just had the low frequency at the same levels as the mid range, it would suck. It'd be boring. It'd be anemic. Our ears want bass. And let's not forget, this is all about fun too. And bass is fun. Feeling that impact in your gut. 
That's what it's all about to me. So we want to have that little extra emphasis in the low frequencies um, because our ears want it, but also because it's that fun, exciting aspect of just an awesome kick-ass audio system in your car. On the, Can I on the in for a sec? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so uh, the curves that you're looking at here, if you're looking at the left side of the screen, that's um, the low frequency aspect that Rob was just talking about. And you'll notice that all of them have a gentle um, plateauing where it doesn't continue to rise. In many vehicles, if it's a, uh, depending on the, the way the, the vehicle set up, that, that may continue to rise. And what Rob is talking about is work with the natural energy of the vehicle. If it's continuing to rise, let it rise. There's no reason to try to pull any of that down. But that's not as common as we'd like where there's a continuing of rising energy as you get lower in frequency. So we show the taper at the low end. Similarly, at the t on the high end, on the far right side of the screen, the higher frequency stuff. In some vehicles, it's very live and very sibling. So you'll see that the high frequencies continue to extend out even up to the highest frequencies. But in many applications, you'll see it tapering off. If it's tapering off, it may not be easy to get that energy back up. And if it's already up, there's really no reason to pull it back down. So don't fight the car if you don't have to. Kind of you know get it set up and remember, any one of these curves would sound very different if you had all four set up. The curve is not what you listen to. You listen to the audio system. The curve is a target to shoot for. So if you get it to match one of these curves nicely, when you listen to it, then you make the determination if you want to try to get the high frequencies to, to rise up again, or if the low frequencies need any adjustment. Let the vehicle pick the curve that you target, then you listen to it when you're done. Does that make sense, Rob? Boy, it's kind of where I was trying to go, but you're a little more elegant than I was there. <laughs> All right. So after we've identified the curve, we need to, to make our adjustments. But the thing is, you're never going to have a measurement that is perfect as that curve. So the examples we have on screen here, um, this is using a, an app I like to use for um, uh, quick and easy tuning called Audio Tools. It's uh, I use iOS, so iPhones, iPads. 20 bucks in the app store, totally worth it. Um, if you're an Android user, um, Advanced Spectrum Analyzer is a good one for your phone. And of course, if you have the hardware, mics, sound cards, um, you can use programs like REW, True RTA as well on your uh, computer side of things to do this tuning process. But if you look at these two um, target curves here, when you're making your adjustments, you're never gonna have a measurement that looks perfectly like that red line you're gonna have some sort of deviation from it. And what we say for this basic tune is to strive to be plus minus dB from flat. And what does that mean? We'll talk about that on the next slide. If you wanna get even to a higher level to further get an improved frequency response, you can do a little more work and go plus minus three dB. And for you know those top level SQ systems, kind of what we'll get into in session 301 with the advanced tune, plus minus one and a half dB from flat. So we wanna be closer to that red line. So what does plus minus five dB look like? Well, it looks something like this. That blue line you see under the red line is my actual acoustical measurement. So that's the microphone in the driver's seat listening to one pass band of speakers. One of the things with the basic tune, we're not gonna tune every speaker individually. We're actually gonna do I like to call it the, the quadrants of the car. So the right front all together. So if it was an active three-way system, you would have your tweeter, mid-range, and mid-base all playing at the same time, and that's it, nothing else. No left front, no rears, no subs. You're only gonna analyze that one corner of the car. In the advanced system, that's where you'll start getting into specific driver curves. We're gonna look at a passband curve, if you will, for the full range or you know wide range, whatever you wanna call it, for, for the front of the vehicle in a specific corner. And if you look at that blue line, it's no more than five dB from flat. But that also brings up a question, how do you know what flat is? How did I know 60 dB is flat? Because I didn't have that red line there when I took that measurement. So an easy way to determine flat is look at your lowest response. So on that measurement, on the bottom, left to right is low frequency to high frequency and top, bottom to top is amplitude. How loud is it? And you'll see on the right side, we have 50 decibels, 60 decibels, 70 decibels, and in between, we have the fives, 55, 65, et cetera. 
So looking at that measurement, if my lowest point is around 55 dB and I want to be plus minus 5 dB from flat, that tells me if my low is 55, 60 is flat, 65 is my peak. So if I'm anywhere between 55 and 65 decibels in the mid-range high frequency section, I'm good. When you have a measurement that looks like this, stop. This is where you get into the weeds and spend way more time than you need to trying to fix a car because we try to make it perfect. We try to make it match that red line. And you also got to remember- time for the banana joke? Anybody say what's- is this a good time for the banana joke? Sure. Is it ever a good time for the banana joke? No, it's not. And I, I admit fully that I stole this from Ken Ward. He may have stole it from someone else, but I'll give him the credit. You know, when, what Rob is saying, if you get it to this point, just stop. And the joke is that I know how to spell banana. I just don't know when to stop because it just seems to keep on going. And if you wanted to, yeah, sure. There's a couple of things about this curve that I could probably make better, but it's probably going to take me a couple of more hours. And is it worth it? I don't know. Why don't we listen to it and then determine if we need to make any changes? So you get it to look like this on your screen. Stop. Just stop and listen to it. Enjoy it for a little bit and see if it needs any more adjustment. And if it does, go back. You also got to remember, this is one pass pan only. When you combine left and right together and acoustics and phase kick in, you'll actually probably see some corrections and that window of deviation will shrink as you may see a little bit later on when we do the video of this live process. But don't try to make it perfect. You know, this is what you want to achieve. This is going to yield fantastic results because we're taking out all those spikes. Again, I'd rather have a, a, a DSP based system with lower end speakers than high end speakers without DSP because I'm taking out all the annoying acoustical boosts that the cabin is causing yielding a smoother more totally balanced response it may not be as loud but that's what levels are at the end are for so we're always going to start i always recommend when we do your analysis taking your acoustical measurements making your adjustments to always start with the passenger side first if you're tuning for the driver's seat of course the reason we want to start with the passenger is it's the furthest pair of speakers away you know as as uh, distance doubles, we lose, you know, a couple dB of output. So I'm, a, I'm never a fan of boosting because if we don't do boosting right, we can get into trouble. I'm not saying don't ever boost, but I like cuts. So if we start with the passenger side, that means we can lower the closer driver side speakers to match the amplitude level of the right side. Because remember, one of the pillars is levels, right? We need equal levels to help with that center image. We're closer to those driver speakers, left side speakers in the driver's seat. So naturally they're gonna be louder. So by starting with the right side, it allows us to attenuate the left side to match instead of having to heavily boost the passenger side to get to the level that the driver side is at. So I always go passenger side first, then the driver side. You are then gonna combine left and right together to make sure there's no weirdness after we uh, take make our corrections and measurements. If you have rear speakers, again, you'll start with one side of the rear, then the other side of the rear, combine those to make sure there's no weirdness, combine them with the front to make sure there's no issues. When I talk about issues, usually polarity related issues that are causing instant suck outs in your frequency response, then we're going to add the subwoofer and make those adjustments. So let's take a look here. This is uh, my old Honda Civic. I had a, a Fix 82 going digitally into a Tweak D8 into an XD, um, ampl uh, XD amplifiers with active C5 two ways up front and a uh, subwoofer in the rear. So, hey Rob? yes, Steve. Sorry to jump in on you there. I got a really good question that came through. Is it possible that we could share information on, like if you're using audio tools on how to get a red line to show up so that we could tune to that target? I know we can't do it here today, but is, it, is that something we could guide people on later? And I wanted yeah. to interrupt you because I think more than one person is going to wonder about that too. So we'll figure out to address it. Yeah, so that's actually a good point. There is a way to do that. Maybe we can do a help center article on that. Um, these images here, that red line was actually all done in Photoshop after I took measurements. So you'll see in the video coming up when I make do the live tuning, there is no red line. You'll see how you you'll see in the video coming up how to analyze where your low point is and how to make your adjustments to that. The, the red line now is all Photoshop to make the presentation nice and you can see what's going on. 
Um, so uh, if it's not going to be there. You don't always need it, but it is nice to have. And there are ways to input that, I think, using a text file or something like that on the phone. Um, you can also if it is in audio tools, yes, you can. It's a string of digits that you upload in, and it'll put the curve on there as an overlay. It may be a, a pay to play kind of thing, but we can cover that separately offline. So that's yeah, it is. It's a it's an upcharge for audio tools. Rew, it's free to put it in, and it's fairly simple. Um, if one of you guys wants to uh, to ping us, and we can get you a file for uh, Rew that we use. Um, we can do that too. So the, the options there. Don't, don't want to delay anymore, Rob. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that was a fantastic question because all of these images have it. So I can, I'm sure that would have come up. So, so uh, again, this is an active system here. So we have a couple different pass bands we're looking at on this measurement. Going left to right, um, we have the dotted lines. To the left of the first pair of dotted lines, that's going to be my subwoofer response. So that's why we have no energy there. Because remember, we're only looking at the right front speakers. In the middle, we have our mid range, big chunk of energy in our uh, C5, 6.5. And, and then we have a high pass filter at 5K, which is for our tweeter. So this is a raw measurement of my vehicle. And if this was a passive system, it, it would be, look the same except we wouldn't have that separate filter for the uh, high frequencies where we could do the level adjustment we're gonna talk about right now. So let's take a look here. We have three pass bands and we're gonna really look at adjusting in this measurement, the mid range and the high frequencies. So we're gonna start right there and you'll notice on the high frequency side of things, there is a big boost, there's a big chunk of energy above uh, where I want my flat measurement to be. So again, looking at the measurement, if my low point's around 55, that tells me I want to be around 60. But I know on my car, the way the reflective surfaces were, my tweeters were a little aggressive. So that's why I went for a curve that kind of had a little bit more of a tail off on the, high, on the top end to help tame uh, the reflectiveness I was getting because of the plastic panels and all of that stuff. So instead of using EQ to bring that down, this is where the benefit of going active really is because I essentially have a volume control for that specific channel with level trim. So by lowering the level trim for that specific channel, I'm actually able to bring that high frequency channel down into that plus minus five dB from flat range I wanna be. So a couple of clicks of attenuation, I'm able to now balance my tweeter to the mid range without, without chewing up EQ bands and wasting a lot of time. It's a very easy process. That's why I'm a big fan of using level trim to balance. Now that that's kind of where I want that to be, I'm going to start focusing on the mid range. And really, there's if you look at the curve, there's really two spikes of energy that stand out. Uh, you know, the one around 1K, 2K, that's borderline. That was like the peak of the measurement. So we'll, we're going to let that go. But centered around, you know, 350, 400 hertz, and then around 100 to 125 hertz, we have some big spikes of energy we can take, a, take care of with that parametric EQ. And that's really where the beauty of parametric EQ comes in. Kevin showed us in session 106 the functionality where left click allows us to, to find the center image or the center frequency. Right clicking allows us to change the Q. And you'll notice these two cuts have different widths to them. Band two is a narrower cut than band four. And that's because the frequency response showed I had a larger chunk of energy, a wider chunk of energy, if you will, uh, around 400 Hertz. So this is where that parametric allows us to come in and quickly make those adjustments. And with two cuts on the EQ, that's gonna bring that, those chunks down. And now I'm well within plus minus five dB from my target curve. So with level trim and two bands of cut, I essentially have the passenger side of the car done. And then I'm going to repeat those steps on the left side of the vehicle. So I'll mute Can the right back? front. Is it possible to go back to that slide where you had uh, those two peaks pulled down? Okay, go ahead and pull those down. So I notice right now that the, the arrow to furthest to the left, that's that region, like 125 hertz and down, is well below the target curve. What's going on there? Is that going to be okay? That will be because we don't have the subwoofer playing right now. So once the sub be becomes unmuted, then we'll look at that. And again, that's where looking at the crossovers uh, come in as well, um, to, to, which we'll talk about that actually, uh, I think, in two slides. So 
But yeah, when I did that, remember, this is a pass band only. So no subwoofer. We're essentially playing 80 hertz and above on all of the speakers in the vehicle. Got it. Thank after you. We're done, after we're done with the right side, we're going to mute that. We'll unmute all of the left front speakers, make the same adjustments, try to make our left measurement match the right measurement. Um, you can do that in audio tools. You can save your uh, trace of one side to uh, have it laid on the screen and then a live measurement on top to make uh, adjustments to match, which really helps further improve your center image. So here you can see left and right combined. Um, our measurement actually got a little better. We're even closer to that red line than we were with just the right side by itself. One thing you'll notice in all of these images and in the video coming up is there's always a null at 1K. I think that's something important to discuss real quick because there's things in the vehicle you cannot always fix. Everything coming up, you're going to see that, that cut at 1K, and I'm pretty sure it was from my steering wheel. Um, there was just something with the steering wheel that was blocking where the microphone was 1K from being played properly. And it, it was really an acoustical issue in the car. It was nothing to do with frequency response. I don't recommend this, but I did it for, for giggles. But I did a, a 12 dB boost at 1K, and my frequency response didn't even budge on the measurement because it wasn't a frequency issue. It was some sort of acoustical uh, issue uh, in the vehicle. So, no, yeah. I also noticed that the blue line is a little higher than it used to be. What's going on there? When we combine left and right together, we're going to get more amplitude How because we have amplitude at this point. Yes. <laughs> uh, again, we'll see when we get into the video. Um, when I combine them, you'll see a nice big jump from the left and right speakers uh, when you combine them. So, but you, know, you can't fix everything. Again, that's really the basic tune is all about. It's you can see in this measurement we have removed those big peaks of excess energy, giving us a more tonally balanced response uh, that we can then listen and make further adjustments to if needed. So after we've uh, got our left and right front speakers dialed in, now we can start looking in the low frequency domain. So remember, our subwoofer has been muted. So we're going to come in and we're going to actually unmute the subwoofer. And it is literally off the charts, way above uh, the the the, the, the target curve, if you will. So we're gonna want that, I usually say with bass, around 15, depending how big of a bass head you are, 15 to 20 dB above the mid range. So again, if, if my mid range is around, you know, 60, 55 dBs, I'm gonna, with level trip, lower the low frequency response until it's around 70 decibels, cause that's in that window we wanna be. And again, I didn't even use EQ on that. That was just level trim to balance the subwoofers to the uh, mid-range and high frequency. So we were talking about earlier on uh, that low frequency area when, where Steve was asking what was happening around 80 Hertz. This is a key time to really make sure your filters are set at the right frequency. Um, some tricks, I'm all about using as few bases of EQ as possible. So if you find if you have maybe a low pass filter and a high pass filter, both set at 80 Hertz, and you have a big chunk of energy on your acoustical measurement around 80 Hertz, instead of trying to use an EQ to figure to fix that, trying to figure out if it's being caused by the sub or is that on the six and a half, maybe you separate your filters a little bit. So instead of 80, 80, maybe you bump the mid range uh, from an 80 Hertz high pass to 100 or 120 Hertz high pass. By separating the filters, you're not losing any energy. Remember, a crossover is two filters combined. It's a summation of the channels. Now, that summation is causing a spike of energy. By separating them, it helps bleed off some of that extra energy. You know, you're not losing frequencies. We're, we're essentially bleeding off the summation of them, if you will. Likewise, if you find maybe for some reason you have a bit of a null around your uh, filter points, maybe you overlap them and increase the summation, which will bring up some of that acoustical energy without having to go into the EQ or levels and start boosting. So those are just some cool tricks, and that's a really key point right there where you may want to look at separating or combining or uh, overlapping your filter points. So now here's one of the key levels, and this is something I feel gets overlooked a lot, 
after we use in an active system level trim to balance all of our speakers, after we've made EQ cuts, the system probably isn't going to be as loud as it once was because we removed a lot of energy. This is where those link icons Kevin was showing us in session 106, the tune click through. Click on link all. We want orange, the little square oranges. We want all of the orange, all of the outputs lit up orange with those little icons. And we're going to increase all of the individual channels at the same time until the loudest channel in the system shows a red signal strength indicator. That means the loudest channel, the hottest channel is clipping. We're then with, I always hold shift down because when you hold shift and use the arrow keys, you can increase or decrease your level by one tenth of a dB. And I'm gonna hit shift down and start lowering by a tenth of a dB until that loudest channel, we're gonna lower all channels together again, but I'm gonna lower until that loudest channel goes from red to yellow. When you do this, that gives you your max non-clipped output from the amplifier. So full output potential without destroying any of the balance we did during the tuning process. I see often we go in and we make all of our level changes so everything has that center image, but we don't link everything and then further boost. Remember, we have indicators on the amplifier that tell you when you're clipping. So make sure after the tuning process, link all channels and increase output until the loudest, hottest channel shows clipping and slowly bring it down until it turns back to a yellow indicator. This will get you full output potential and help gain back some of that amplitude that was lost during the tuning process from us removing excess energy in the vehicle. After we do all of this, this is the important part. This is where you listen to familiar music. Um, I say if you're a retailer, if you're an installer, you probably wait on this part until the customer's with you because this is their system, you know, have, you know, play music that they know. And I think when you make these types of adjustments, you're probably not diving deep into the EQ. I find most of the time it's probably level trim. Oh, the tweeters are a little bright. Use level trim to knock them down a dB or two. Or, you know, sometimes if the mid range sounds a little wonky, you know, usually, uh, you know, if you need to make some small cuts, or again, I usually find sometimes it's just a level change to help bring that in. But you're just gonna make some small minor adjustments, you know, salt and pepper, if you will, um, based on what your listening preferences are. Maybe they like the tweeters sizzling, so you crank them up a couple more dB. Just make sure you're not clipping the outputs and you'll do <clears throat> So this process, as you can see, this was the finished result of, of this system, a two-way front stage active and subwoofers. And it was four bands of cut combined on the left and right mid-range, level trim adjustments on the tweeters and the subwoofers, and that was it. It wasn't a lot of work. And again, if you're using a passive system, you can do all, you can still make this happen with this curve. You just lose the advantage of having the level trim on the tweeters because we have that passive network. So you should still strive to have your, your, your system measure like this, but we're gonna have to use more EQ to help um, tame the tweeters since we don't have the level trim option. So this can still be done with passive, just not as flexible as if we go active. So now that I kind of covered the steps, I have a quick video to show you how actual quick and simple this process is. So this is done using a tweak. Obviously it'll still work the same with VXI type products. So when I start the video here, you're gonna see we go through that setup tool where we put in the information for the car. And then when I start tuning the vehicle, it's actually gonna go picture in picture. You're gonna see my Audio Tools FFT um, uh, capturing pink noise in my vehicle. And as I make adjustments in tune software, you're actually gonna see the FFT respond. So when I start lowering the tweeters, you're actually gonna see the tweeter high frequency on the FFT go down. So this is really cool to see it all real time and how uh, actually efficient really using tune software is. So let's get started here. So obviously with any um, project file for Tweaker VXI, you're going to want to name it. If you're a retailer, I say the customer's name and vehicle. That way we know where, what it is when we look for the file. Vehicle information. I always say in the notes section, um, probably put in uh, the product that's installed in the vehicle. So in this case, it was C5s, um, Fix 82, a Tweak. I think I had a 12W6 and um, XD amps in there. 
Um, if you have presets, probably some notes about presets, red presets, driver optimized, blue presets, multi-seat tune. Um, that way, if someone else gets in the vehicle, they know what the presets are, they know what the equipment is. So we click next. Now here's that cool setup tool. You'll notice on the input side, I had to fix 82 with the Toslink input. So I select optical two-channel SPDIF. And then I had a three-way system, tweeter, woofer, or mid-range and subwoofer. So when I select three-way, you'll see it labels and uh, crosses over all of my uh, channels. This is where I can put in the speaker distances I had already written down from the tip of my nose to every speaker in the vehicle. I click OK, and I'm already tuning the car. That's how quick and easy this setup tool is. So now we'll see here, I have my uh, software. I have my FFT in the top corner. And when I unmute everything, you're going to want to make sure your EQs are unlinked. I always like to use the highest resolution screen. And you'll notice now when I turn up the volume right here, FFT comes alive, we're picking up the pink noise. So looking at that measurement, if I, my lowest point's around 45 dB, I want 50 to be flat. So I'm going to come in, I'm going to start attenuating the left tweeter here and bring that down using level trim in that bottom right corner until the tweeter's at 50 decibels, because that's what flat is, because my low point's 45, plus minus five, right? Now here's where the EQ comes in. I'm gonna cut, and see how I move the center frequency around until that spike to the, the center there gets done, and then I right click, make that a little wider to bleed off some of that energy, 50 dB, perfect. Again, band two, I'm just gonna cut and slowly move around and massage band two, until the measurement looks the way I want, which is uh, about right here. I think I'm moving around a little more. And there you go. Other than that stupid null I'm stuck with, I'm plus minus 5 dB from 50. Is it perfect? No, but it doesn't have to be. So now I'm going to mute. I come in and I unmute the opposite side of the car. Again, if my left tweeters were at 50, I'm going to start attenuating this pair of tweeters until I'm at 50 decibels. And once the tweeter comes down to 50 dB, you'll notice other than around 100 hertz, I'm pretty much plus minus 5 dB. So I go to EQ2 because I want to adjust my other side. Again, band 2, I just make a cut. I'm just going to move around the center frequency. Bam, that's perfect. One band of cut. That's all I needed on the right side there. I'm going to combine left and right together. As we discuss, you're going to see the amplitude goes up. Look at that. Other than that 1K null, I'm like plus minus 2.5 two dB from flat. That's awesome. So now I unmute the subwoofer. It is literally off the charts. So I'm gonna link my subwoofer channels together and I'm gonna lower the output of the subwoofer until I'm around, you know, 70 dB because I like a little more bass. And that's it. And if you wanna make adjustments, you get in here, you know, 100 Hertz, that kind of, you can see how that bled off some of the energy uh, right there, just to show you what happens there with that measurement. But that was it. I mean, you know, it's only a couple of minutes to take out a lot of obnoxious peaks of energy in the car. And it sounds pretty good. Now, when I went in, I made a couple level changes to the tweeters after the fact. Um, this was without a doubt a phenomenal sounding system and it didn't take a lot of work. Don't so just because, huh? <laughs> I didn't want you to change the slide. I noticed on the response curve that there was a couple other areas that we could massage if we wanted to. Back to the back of the joke. And since we only really used at most two bands of EQ, you still have eight other bands if you wanted to go after those things. Uh, and that's what's really cool about it. Once you get to that point, like Rob just showed us, you're really done. Um, and then beyond that, it's just that fine tuning and that last bit that you could spend a lot of time on if you want, or maybe it's nice and quick. But I, I personally like to get to the listening part as quickly as I can. So dial it in real close, you know, plus or minus 5 dB to that target curve. Don't worry about anything after you get into that, that, that window. Then just jump in and start listening to stuff. And Rob mentioned listening to, to some familiar music. Don't listen to music that you think old guys like me want to hear. Listen to music that you think your customer might hear, or if you're, you are the customer that you like to listen to. Just know that different recordings may present themselves differently. If you're listening to something that's really aggressive in the mid range, like some Godsmack or something like that, don't go crazy trying to bring that level down because that may just be what the recording is. That's why familiar music is what you should focus on, not some track that somebody said sounds really, really good. After you get it to sound good with familiar stuff, then you can go to those tracks. You need to do it with stuff you know, though. Yeah. 
Yeah, any music that I listen to that I tune with, I try to listen to it on like a two channel system in my home and like a, a decent environment. So I know how the music presents itself. And I just try to mimic that presentation in the vehicle itself. So yeah, for me, you know, this whole process, you know, you, you saw how quick and easy it is. I like this process, especially if you're new to DSP, because it takes away some of the intimidation. This shows you don't have to make it perfect to, to sound good. This is a quick way if you're a novice. That, that, by the way, that video, that was my fourth attempt ever tuning a car. I had never used a DSP before. Being, I, you know, I'm, I come from a sales background. I wasn't an installer. So even though I had sold DSP all the way back in 2006 or seven, I'd been selling it. I had never actually physically tuned a vehicle before. So if I could do that on my fourth attempt, I know anybody can do this. So the whole idea of the 10 minute tune and this, or the basic tune and this process of setting gains, using proper level crossover and EQ adjustments really takes a lot of the intimidation factor out because you don't have to make it perfect. We're giving you a curve to achieve. And the nice thing about this also is it's consistent. By choosing a curve, you're always gonna have consistent results. It's not gonna sound different depending on who's tuning the car because if you know what the end game is anyone should be able to get to the end game we're not relying on our ears or expertise and you know mics they don't lie acoustical analysis is going to be way better than our ears and if you think about it especially if you've been in car audio for a long time or if you work around power tools whatever the case may be or you're getting older our ears become compromised and we can't rely on them what we may think is total, tonally balanced could be aggressive and in your face to someone else. So a microphone and an RTA is always gonna give you a true response. And then we can make adjustments as needed based off of what the listening preferences are gonna be. But really with the basic tune, it's all about setting realistic goals and expectations. You know, I think this sounds fantastic. Uh, you know, an audio file may say it sounds good, but it needs more. Again, that's what the next session is going to be all about. But really, when it comes down to tuning a vehicle, no one to stop, especially for the enthusiasts where you just want it loud, dynamic, fun, and reliable. That's really what this is all about. But it's going to sound great as well. So um, we covered a lot. Um, I'm going to switch over to close out my keynote, and we can switch over to any uh, questions that, that may have come up. Fantastic, Rob. Thank you so much. One uh, question did come in just a moment ago asking about um, how you set up the, um, the audio tools on your phone. Uh, the question was, um, where did you put, like, it's obviously on your phone, so how did you physically do all of that? This is where it gets very high tech. Right, I know, this My phone speak slowly. Don't talk like me. Speak slow. <laughs> <laughs> I crammed my phone in the headrest with the microphone facing the steering wheel. I sat in the passenger seat with my laptop on my lap, looking at the phone in the uh, headrest so I could see all the spikes I wanted to adjust. And I literally sat there making adjustments as I had my head looking at the phone in the headrest. Now, if you, uh, if, you know, the other question that comes up though, I get is, well, you're tuning with the phone. This is, we're not dealing with lab grade measurements here. An iPhone has a phenomenal microphone in it. If you have a higher level Android phone, a Samsung, one a more expensive LG or Motorola, those have good phones or uh, microphones. Some of the entry level inexpensive Android phones, you might not want to take measurements with that because they probably have a lower quality microphone. The hardware is not going to be as good as a Galaxy phone would. So, you know, it, it, some of it may depend on the phone, but again, this is, this is a basic tune. We're not taking lab quality measurements here. Um, I like to use a, for this type of tuning, I use a one octave FFT. Um, you know, I like on an FF, one, I use FFT. I don't use RTAs. Um, you'll notice on that, on all of those measurements I showed, you guys didn't see bars or dots like you would normally see with an RTA. I found when I tried to tune with an RTA, I tried to make every single bar or dot perfect. And that's really not what the basic tune's all about. We, I, I like to think of it as big picture stuff. Where are my big picture things I need to focus on? And we saw those big chunks of energy we took out. So when I was with an FFT for me, it allowed me to easier see big picture items 
and to and analyze those and not try to over tune. So for me, a one octave FFT for this type of tuning is a great way to go. Um, when we get into the advanced session, we'll probably want to go to a higher resolution so we can really start to, to, to see some of those smaller details we may want to fix. And a lot of it at that point is mostly to make left and right further match to further enhance that center image. So, um, but if you have a microphone, just put the microphone uh, in, in, you know, in between the headrest and the seat. Um, or if you, you know, you can use a mic stand to hold the mic a microphone up. But most importantly, make sure the seat is where the listener is going to be, and try to get that headphone where their head's going to be. I would recommend when you know, if you're a retailer, or even if it's yourself, you know, tape marks. You know, put tape on the seat, put tape on the pillar, so you know where you, like, the level of where the ears are, where the customer's nose is going to be. The closer we are with a microphone to where the actual listening position is, the more accurate our measurements and the better it's going to sound for the end user when they're in that spot. To add a couple things to that, Rob, is I normally take my case off of my phone because it has kind of a funnel into the microphone itself um, and also kind of blocks it off a little bit too. So if I'm using my phone, in audio tools, I will take the case off of it. Also understand that your phone may present some oddities on the microphone and in, in the measurements too. Um, like above 10K, mine really drops off on my iPhone. Um, and I thought it was something that was presenting in the vehicle and I was chasing my tail. And finally I went back to, uh, to the computer and I ran some tones in my home and I realized that it was actually the microphone of the phone that was falling off and not the vehicle that was falling off. So just Kevin, you bring up an excellent point. If you guys are doing tuning and on the meter or the analysis system that you're using, if, if, you, if you're making changes and you don't see it show up on the meter, something's wrong with your measurement tool. Trust your ears, because if you're sitting in the car, I was gonna make a joke, Kevin, that maybe your reference system is also rolling off at 10K. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Um, but it made me remember that, you know, sometimes I've been in, in situations where we're so focused on looking at the display that we're making all these changes and the display's not changing. It's like, well, what's wrong? <laughs> the mic was disconnected. So you gotta pay attention to those things. So a couple of comments that came in from Facebook, you can pick up a decent microphone, even a USB based mi microphone for like 70 bucks. And that's going to do a phenomenal job for you. Um, there's a couple of companies that make um, uh, lightning port uh, microphones that you can plug into your iPhone or wherever the case may be that can get you even better results. If you have an abnormality in the measurement, um, some of the phones have settings built in where there's equalization to make things sound a certain way that sometimes will affect the microphones. So just bear that in mind when you get into the measurement of all this stuff. And Rob brought up a really interesting point. You know, we focus on audio tools an awful lot because we, we happen to have iPhones. And there's one nice thing about iPhones, don't, don't hate me, I, I know I'm a fanboy, but there's a nice thing about the iPhones that the microphones are all very consistent. The hardware is kind of a known quantity. So we know what the microphone's gonna be like. When I say we, as an industry, we all know. So audio tools is written on, you know, on that platform because it knows the reference mic. It knows what to expect from that microphone. And as Rob pointed out, the Android platform, there's a bunch of different hardware companies that are making devices that will use that operating system. So creating an app that knows what the microphone is, is very, very challenging. So that's why it's not as easy to find a good measurements uh, um, app for the Android platform because of the differences in microphone. So just know about those differences when you get into this. Uh, one of the other things I see that's going on a lot on Facebook is asking about getting your reference source into the uh, into the system. Um, I, Bluetooth is the last resort. The compressions that happen on Bluetooth may pose some weird oddities at the upper end and the lower end, um, just the way that the compression of the music works. Um, if you can put it on a USB thumb drive, that's great. Um, if you can uh, plug in directly with with any type of a USB device other than a, a thumb drive, then that would work too. Um, but thumb drive and CD are my go-to. And then, uh, like we said on there, if there's no auxiliary that you can't get into it, then you could possibly bypass the receiver and go directly into the amplifiers. I do that sometimes with timing, um, 
you know, timing and, and phase related uh, content. However, if I am doing tuning, I try to always go through the receiver because there may be some weird EQing, whether it's uh, a factory or aftermarket um, that may present itself on the backside that you don't see if you bypass that. That's what I love about the you know, a tuning process like this. You don't need extravagant hardware, just some sort of RTA, FFT, something where we can see just the acoustical analysis. That's all you need. And it doesn't have to be lab grade $500 microphones. So it's, uh, you know, just something, a phone, most of the time is all you're going to need to to get your system dialed in the right way. And we have these files available on our help center um, that you can go in and download and put them on a thumb drive and be able to use them that way. Um, so if finding the files is your problem to be able to put on a thumb drive um, or on some sort of USB device, rather than just you know having them on you know whatever streaming source that you have, if you can't find the files, you can go to our uh, help center and be able to download those files. Free. Free. <laughs> a couple of quick things I wanted to jump on. I saw some uh, comments uh, that came in. One, Adam in our WebEx area, he said that Rob made a good point, point regarding the dip that he had in the Civic at 1K when he tried to add the 12 dB boost to see what it did. And his comment was, if you make a change and it doesn't help, undo the change. Because <laughs> if it's not helping it, you're just hurting things in some way. Um, and, you know, that's an excellent point that Adam brought up. Additionally, there's been some chatter on Facebook. Um, there was questions about audio tools. So I put a link on our Facebook page to the audio tools app for the iPhone. And uh, Jeffrey is pointing out that he does about 40 tunes a year for the shops that he uh, works on, with. And, uh, and individually, he's got a $70 mic and uh, room EQ wizard on his computer. So he bought a $70 mic and downloaded a free set of software and he's he's doing this all day long. And the key point that he brought up, the rest is just learning how to tune. You know a method now, practice will make perfect. Well, maybe not perfect, but practice is gonna make it a lot easier for you to get really great results. So, you know, Jeffrey's been you know chiming in on Facebook and I think that's a really good point. A minimal investment in hardware and possibly software, depending on what you wanna use, and then some investment in time. You know, the, the mechanisms and all that other stuff, once you start working with it, it becomes really easy. The best thing to do is just get in there and start. So if you're a consumer and you got an amplifier in your car and you got some of these basic tools, just go in and mess around. And something that I think is great, um, and actually I've talked to a couple of people, um, you know, my friend Mark, Mark Eldridge and I, we've talked about this in the past, and he actually does something like this in some of the trainings he's done, is learning how to identify frequencies by messing around with an EQ. So uh, Mark does this thing where you have two EQs that are wired up together so that you have two people, one with each EQ. And one guy takes an EQ slider or an EQ band and he makes an adjustment like a boost or a cut at let's just say 1K. And the other guy is listening to the speakers that are playing and has to identify what change was made and try to counteract it. So if let's say, you know, Kevin and I are doing this, if Kevin boosts 1K, I have to, you know, the right answer is to cut 1K. And it's a great way of training your hearing uh, what these different frequencies may sound like. So what I would do is if you're learning how to do this, make huge changes at moderate levels, <laughs> make huge changes, you know, take a band and just boost it way up and listen to that and then cut it way down and listen to it and then kind of dial it back and forth until you make it sound the way you feel it needs to sound. That's tuning. And that comes from experience. And that's a great way of training your hearing to identify you know, if you just listen to a track and says, you know, something just doesn't sound right. And I tried a level adjustment and that didn't do it. So it must be frequency specific. How do you find that frequency? Well, you can look at an RTA or an FFT. That's one way. But the best way, I think, is once you kind of dial it in, figure out what's right. And by boosting the hell out of it and cutting the hell out of it and then dialing it back and forth until you make it sound exactly the way you want. Use these for those final adjustment, not those microphones. Just use, you know, your built-in measurement system all day long. So excellent comments that came in there. Thank you for those guys. So another comment that came in uh, was about uh, the Phonic. The Phonic makes a, a handheld uh, measurement device that has a built-in microphone and it's really, really good. The prices I saw on it were a little high, but I'm being corrected, maybe it's not that expensive. If you're doing this for a living, make the investment, right? Make the investment on something that's repeatable, that you're comfortable with, whatever you're comfortable with. You know, personally, I like Jeffrey's idea. Let's grab a basic microphone and use REW or some other basic measurement system um, that's free, because I like free. <laughs> um, so whatever you got to do to make that work. 
Another comment, I understand we should finish listening to music. Um, the comment was about listening to music at full power to see if it's clipping. Um, some of the, the tips that Rob shared with us uh, tells us how to avoid clipping whenever we possibly can. Um, some amount of clipping in certain frequency areas is probably okay. Avoid it at high frequencies and mid-range frequencies. But in a deeper sub region, you can probably get away with a little bit extra. I call it love, a little extra love in a subwoofer if you really need it. Um, listening to music at full power can be very dangerous. Um, if you're dealing with a 400 watt system with a couple of speakers, that's one thing. But if you got a few thousand watts in a full on system like that, that could be dangerous. Listen to it at a level that makes you comfortable. Let's put it that way. Whatever that level is, what you want to do is avoid stressing the drivers or the electrical system of the vehicle because that can skew a lot of your measurements. Um, yes, I know it's a real situation that people listen to it at that level, but if you're trying to get it dialed in, you probably want to avoid that. Test it at those higher levels just to make sure you're not in any trouble, but I wouldn't spend a lot of time listening there. We want you to enjoy music for a long period of time, so don't do that kind of damage. Yeah, and if you listen to it at a at a full power level, you're going to fatigue your ears in a in a second and not be able to hear those oddities too. So listen to it at a moderate level, like Steve said, something you're comfortable with. Listen for your oddities, make your adjustments. And then if you want to turn it up um, after everything's dialed in, just to make a quick check, feel free to do that. But just be careful to not damage your hearing. Uh, Jeffrey, again, he's he's a treasure trove of information in the Facebook chat. Um, Jeffrey mentions that Harmon offers an app called How to Listen. Sadly, it doesn't work on my Mac. So I'm not happy with, about this, but it's a great way of training your hearing. And it's, a, as the, the app name, How to Listen, if you can run that, it is really, really cool. Um, it's an excellent uh, little routine that they go through that kind of trains your hearing on what to pick up on and, and how to listen. A really good input there. Got a comment here that um, many of us may know how to adjust an EQ once they get set up to the point where they can take measurements. And sometimes getting set up to take those measurements can take a little bit and a little bit of guidance. Um, Audio Tools is relatively straightforward. Rob's measurement system, we shoved it into the headrest with the mic pointing to the front of the vehicle. Off you go. You know, make it so you can see the screen from the passenger side and you should be fine. Um, so that's simple, but something slightly more complicated like what Jeffrey has set up uh, using REW and an external microphone. Sometimes getting the software and microphone to work well together can take a couple of clicks here or there and an understanding of what you're doing. It's outside the scope of this training, which has concluded technically, so if you need to log off, we understand. Um, but it is outside the scope of this, but Kevin and I were kind of chatting, Rob, surprise, we're considering doing a session where we just kind of casually talk about things that are not specific to JL Audio or our specific tuning method that might be able to address some of those um, setup uh, procedures of how to get REW connected to a sound card or you know how to you know get a a target curve to line up on your, your measurement system. These are things that maybe we could do as a more casual setting that's you know not JL specific or anything like that. And we can maybe have a little bit of fun with it. Maybe do it at, a, at an hour where it's not a can of soda, maybe something else, you know, something, I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out, but yeah, stay tuned. You know, if we do something like that, we'll let you know.